Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Several weeks ago, we looked, of course, at the Great Commission. It was World Missions Sunday. And three Gospels record the Great Commission. Mark summarizes it this way. Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every living creature. And then, of course, we looked at what, what is this message of the Gospel. The word Gospel literally means good news. Paul summarized it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as this. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he said, this gospel we preach to you. So we know this is the summary of the gospel. Christ died for our sins and Christ rose again according to the scriptures. Now, then we looked, of course, at the book of Acts. It also includes the Great Commission, but before it includes the Great Commission, it reveals the promise of Jesus to his followers to receive power from the Holy Spirit. Now, he made sure to say, you'll receive power from the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be witnesses. So, of course, the connection goes together. The power from the Holy Spirit specifically to enable us to be witnesses of the gospel starting where we are. You remember he said, Jerusalem then worked its way to the uttermost parts of the earth. So right here is where we start, right here is where we are. Now, the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm just recapping the last several Sundays, enables us to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit, if you remember in the book of Galatians chapter 5, is this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is what we can bear in our lives through the power of the Spirit. But Now, we have to look at this. When we look at, at the fruit of the Spirit and our lives producing consistently love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, and so forth, we understand that's a big task. How do we get there? How do we get there from day one of our walk with the Lord to the point where we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us some information on how to get from the first point to bearing the fruit of the Spirit, and it's the book of Romans chapter 12, beginning verse 1. Would you stand as the Scriptures read, please? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and will of God? For I say through the grace given to me to everyone that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but, not all, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love with be, be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. 
Do not set your mind on high things. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the straight message of your word to us, how we can be what you want us to be. We can find our place in your plan. And Father, we ask that we would receive this message. You would aim it directly at the parts of our heart that need it the most. May we leave here with a clear vision of who you are, of who we are, and Father, how we can be a part of this wonderful work of sharing the good news to the nations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Paul said to the Roman Christians, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Several weeks ago, we looked, of course, at those who had the faith and the power of the Holy Spirit gave them boldness to even face death for Jesus Christ. And we'd all like to think that we would have that kind of boldness. I'll die for Christ if that's what it takes. This passage of Scripture says God is more interested in this, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Now, we have to understand Offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, many times we may become convicted about that. We may become excited about that. And sometimes we make a move about that. Have you ever been at church camp or a youth conference at SOAR? And the worship, of course, deals with service and dedication. And we, we get convicted and we, we come up to the altar and we say, I want to present my body a living sacrifice to you. We, we go back to our seats and go home. Well, let me tell you, presenting our bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice is not a once and done thing. You see, offering our bodies and becoming a living sacrifice to the Lord is not accomplished with a one-time trip to the altar, no matter how sincere it may be. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord is an ongoing lifestyle of serving God daily and serving others daily. So we understand, we start looking at that, and all of a sudden, uh, we may have done something up here in the altar or at youth camp or uh, for uh, the, the teen conference or a revival and so forth, but we realize that doesn't cut it today. It's going to have to be every single day. You mean every day? You mean not just on Sunday? You mean every day, even on Monday? You mean everywhere, even the places I have to work? Yes. Now, one thing that becomes very obvious, this task is bigger than we are. It's bigger than we are. We cannot do it on our own. The good news is we've got some help. Jesus promised that. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father, and he will send another helper. Now, King James Version says a comforter. Well, a little bit later on in verse 26, I believe, he says, and when the comforter is come, that is the Holy Spirit. So we know that helper, that comforter, is the Holy Spirit. Now, the word helper or comforter, the Greek word is paraclete. It really means one who comes alongside to help. That's it. So he said, I'm going to give you somebody that's going to come alongside to help. Then right before he ascended to heaven, he says, and when the Holy Spirit comes alongside, you'll have power to do what I have asked you to do. In this passage, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we understand through the power of the Spirit, we are all equipped to be effective to witnesses where we live. In fact, every believer is giving special gifts with which to serve God. In verse 3, it says, I say through the grace given to me to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. It says, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now, we're not talking about saving faith here. These are already believers. God has dealt to each one. Now, the original language, the word each here could also be Every. This is mentioned twice again in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
It says everybody receives a gift. Now, we don't want to miss that. Now, if you miss that, you've missed everything. Everybody receives a gift, or gifts, plural. And you'll see when we get into this, everybody receives gifts, every single one of us. Not everybody has the same gift. He said, we have gifts differing. We have gifts differing. We do not have all the same gift or all the same combinations of gifts. He says, we're like the, the parts of a body. We don't all do the same thing. So God's going to give each of us the ability we need to serve him. We're each equipped to serve in individually distinct ways. Now, what are these gifts? Sometimes we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and we think about some mystical things that perhaps we can never attain to or understand, but you will notice they are all very, very straightforward and easy to understand, especially when you look at the original language. As we go into the gifts, he says, having then gift differing, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. We think of prophecy, we think the prophets of old. And the prophets of old would predict the future. That's one thing that they did that was not their main task. The word prophecy here means to proclaim the message of God, to preach the message of God, to be God's spokesman. These are the folks who God has laid his hand on to preach the message. They may be missionaries, pastors, uh, evangelists that travel around. God has laid their hand, his hand on them and gifted them to proclaim the message. Now, a big part of this gift is just the ability to stand up here and speak in public. I was not aware of this, but I see a lot of times these different studies that say, the, the most prevalent, overwhelming, horrifying fear that people face is to stand up and speak in public. Well, God gives some of us the ability to overcome that, and it's a gift from him. But we have to understand, when God lays his hand on someone to proclaim or to preach or to be his spokesman, there is a qualifier here. He says this, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, that's not, I've got to muster up enough faith to be able to stand here. Now, if you look at the original language, it also means in proportion to his faith or what God has given to him, not saving faith, but of course the faith to do what he gives me to do. But the word our here is really the definite article V. And it says, let him Preach in proportion to the faith. Now, the word the faith here has to do with, that's what they call the total gospel message. In the book of Jude, verse 3, it says, the faith that was for once delivered to the faith, saints. So we know that a lot of times they'll use that word the faith as the, the whole gospel message. Now, that word in proportion means this, let him prophesy in agreement with the gospel message. In other words, I do not have the liberty to get up here and just say anything I want to say. This is not a platform for editorial comment, political opinions, or that sort of thing. God holds us to a responsibility. If we are to stand up and be spokesmen for him, we need to make sure everything he, we say is in agreement with this right here. There are no personal revelations to anybody outside this word. There's no way I can stand up here and say, well, the Bible says this, but God has showed me something else. That's not going to happen when God lays his hand on someone. So that tells us this. Before I walk from here to stand here, it demands study of this right here. How are we going to proclaim faithfully in accordance with the word of God if we're not familiar with it. There's a lot that has to be done and a big responsibility. God equips those that he has laid his hand on to preach the word, to be able to study, understand, and proclaim the word, but there's a responsibility to make sure we are true to the word. 
Oh, we go a little bit further. This may be kind of the same thing. Or of ministry, let us use it in our ministry. Okay, you might say, God didn't call me to the ministry. Well, this word ministry means something altogether different than somebody who surrenders to the gospel ministry. The word here, and some of you have other English translation, means service. Now, the word exactly is diaconus. It's where we get the word deacon, which means servant. So when it says uh, God has gifted some for ministry, it means God has gifted some for service. Now, it is a broad application of practical acts of service. And some English translations says practical acts of service service. Now, and many of these are behind the scenes. He said, well, exactly what are we dealing with? Well, practical acts of service could encompass everything that's done. Let me just give you some things that people are gifted at in our church. And these, I can only speak of this. Practical acts of service include repairing things, building things, the youth room, we finished it up with the talented and gifted guys who could put stuff together and saw boards and run power tools without an emergency room visit. And I just, I'm, I'm really, I really appreciate all of that. But we realize repairing things, building things, decorating things. And we have some gifted people in our church that can really decorate some things when it comes to, of course, Bible school and special things. And you walk through the building and you see the the, uh, the kids' kingdom thing. I could never do that. I could never do that, but we have gifted people who can do that. Cooking things. And my, don't we have a cooking ministry here at Brister Baptist Church? There's, that's a practical act of service that helps, of course, some of the programs that we have on Wednesday night. It also helps with people who come home from the hospital. It also helps when we have funerals and families that are ministered. That is a ministry. That is what is included here, a practical act of of service, sound equipment, and computer work. We got to have that. I got to have people that can do that because, you know, I can't run things and be here at the same time. Have to have other folks who are gifted with that. Cleaning and being able to clean up and tidy up. Uh, mowing, keeping the grounds uh, nice, and trimming hedges. Brother Jeremy was here earlier this week, and he had his hedge trimmers up, and he was cleaning up some of those hedges out in the front, trimming them down and all. And just be thankful, I was not out there because it would not look like that. So I do not have that gift. Other people have that gift. So you, you're kind of getting what's going on here. Uh, keeping the nursery. Now, some of us are not gifted to keep the nursery. And you might say, well, wait a minute. What, what is there to keep the nursery? Listen, I frighten little children sometimes. I can lurch being in the room. I'm not, not going to be real good at the nursery thing, and some people don't need to be in the nursery. But some of you are gifted at that, and you are talented at that, and we need you. We need child care. Something simple as driving. People can't be mobile. They need to go to a doctor's appointment. They need to go to uh, radiation. They need to go to chemotherapy. And the radiation, the chemotherapy is just disabling them. They don't have rides. People drive. Now you're getting the fact that what is not included here, but God gifts people to do these certain things and do them well. Oh, here's one. Organization. I really need people that can organize things. You know how long... I spent this morning looking for my coffee cup of all things. You know, I just can't even keep up with a coffee cup, much less organizing schedules and all. I mean, I lost it. I didn't know where I went. So I looked around the house and found it. I'd been over here. We'd done the bulletin. I'd been through the building, opened it up. I looked on every horizontal surface in the building. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. I mean, it wasn't where. And I finally realized I'd gone to get a book out of my office at home with my coffee cup, set it down, got the book, read what I wanted to get out of it, promptly forgot it was in there. You know, I really need y'all. I've got to have some people who can organize things and have the gift of administration. Now you're getting the fact that what is going on here is because we have some incredibly gifted people who are using their gifts for the work of the Lord. That's, that's, people tell me all the time when I'm uptown, hey, I'm hearing good things about your church. You're doing a good job down there. And I'm thinking, I'm not doing much at all. 
the biggest part of the work that's going on, you people who are gifted and will use your gifts. And see, that's what we're dealing with. You And we're going to get to this a little bit. Maybe say, well, I don't have a gift. Well, this practical act of ministry, there's not too much that's left out of that. And we go a little bit further. It says, of course, uh, ministering to ministry and he who teaches in teaching. Now, this is part of the Great Commission. Jesus said in the book of Matthew chapter 28, he said, go make disciples of all nations. That's, of course, evangelism. Then it says, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. Part of the job that we have as a church is not just to win the lost, but, of course, to disciple and to teach the, the Christians. And, of course, we have to have those. We have to have those who can teach Wednesday night, Sunday school, the teen class. And I've got to have people. It's, it's, it didn't narrow it down. Some people can't teach small kids with the colors and the, the, the pasting and, the, and the, those kind of things. Some people are real gifted at that. And some people are horrified at the idea of teaching teenagers. Well, some people are gifted at that. Then it comes to doing the adult classes, and some people are gifted at that. So we realize that... Being able to teach is a gift that God gives to people. And we, we need all of them. But then again, as long with standing up here behind the, the pulpit, the gift comes along with a responsibility. Those who are gifted or called to teach have to be able to spend the time to do the prep work for the class. God gives us the gift to use. But God gives us, of course, work to do to develop that gift. We go a little bit further. And it says, he who exhorts in exhortation. This is quite interesting. The word there is encouraging, but the original Greek word is going to be familiar. Paraklesis. It's the same root word from which the Holy Spirit's name is given. Encouragement. Comfort. Literally, it means to call someone to another side to help. Now, we have those who are preaching. We have those who are involved in practical acts of service. We have those who are involved in teaching, and they're working really hard. They're working really busy. And then sometimes results don't happen, or they've had a week of all kinds of different things, and they're loaded down. They're loaded down with things that are happening in their personal life, and then it comes time to prep for the teaching ministry or all kinds of, of practical acts of service. You have a busy week where it just seems to all pile in on top of you, and people are so busy, and of course they're, they're loaded down, they're tired, they're discouraged, and those who have the gift of exhortation are those who can build up, who can lift up, who can hold up, those who are busy doing something else because sometimes they get discouraged. They need somebody to come along and make sure they know that they are making a difference and it is important. And they sometimes need you to come along and, and help them with something that they're doing even though that might not be your primary gift. That's what the word encourage means and that is a very important gift. And if you have that gift, please Use that gift. And then it says this, and giving, and giving. It says in this passage, those who are gifted with the gift of giving, let's do it with liberality. But the, the actual word here in the King James says it this way, simplicity. And the, the Greek word has a dual meaning. First of all, it has with simplicity. The word simplicity means no ulterior motives. You're giving. You're giving not for recognition, not for any kind of reward that God will bless me back if I give. You're simply giving because you're giving. And it says the same word means liberality. Uh, it's on over in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, don't give grudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver. So we give. We give liberally. And we give with a happy heart. Now, this is quite interesting because a lot of times people will say, well, I don't have any of these gifts. Okay, you don't have the gift of prophecy. Oh, I don't have the gift of teaching. Oh, I don't have the gift of exhortation. 
Uh, I don't have the gift of ministry. Uh, I don't have to give to this, that. And I say, well, man, you have disqualified yourself except for one thing, giving. So therefore, you have found your gift. If you want to deny everything else, you have found your gift. So uh, thank you in advance, all right? Because God gives us the gift, and some people have the ability to give. They have the means to give. And he said, if that is the case, do it with simplicity. And then he talks about leadership. He who leads with diligence. It's quite inter interesting, the word that he uses for leadership. Proestomy is the Greek word. It is never, ever used in the New Testament to describe a governmental official or a king with great power. Never, ever. This word leadership is always used as a father who is lovingly leading his family or elders and pastors who are lovingly shepherding the church. When it talks about leadership, we're not talking about authority and power just simply vested on us by the position. It speaks of leading by earning the trust of people around us. And sometimes it's not even an official position of leadership. In any group of people, and you get them together, and they have to interact together with long enough, and especially if they're faced with a challenge, in any group of people, a leader will emerge. That leader is typically the one that people look to and they can trust because they're acting responsibly, and they can sense that. And you see, in our church, we have that. We have leaders all over the church, people that folks trust, and sometimes we come to them. Sometimes they're in positions of, of leadership and have offices in the church, like the deacons or the pastors and so forth, and then sometimes they're just other people. And, and you need advice or you need some help. Or we, we look to somebody for guidance. And it says, if you're going to be a leader, you lead not by decree, but by example. Well, there's, there's a very, very high bar of responsibility to those who are in leadership positions. And we can't lead just because I said so. We lead by example and by earning the trust of others. We go a little bit further. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, that sounds like it might be the same as exhortation. And it's, it's very close. And usually somebody might have both of these because you can have more than one gift and you'll excel in some more than one gift. But you, the word mercy is uh, to recognize the pain and move toward it. What this means is there are people that have the gift of ministering to the folks that are in grief. They have a gift for that. They know the right things to say. They know the right things to do just to be there. They, of course, some people who are sick, some people absolutely, positively, and they've told me this, cannot Go to the house of somebody that's terminally ill. But somebody needs to go. And God gifts people with the ability to deal with that kind of pain, and that kind of discomfort in other people. And, and go to those dark valleys. Mercy is seeing the pain and being willing to move into that pain and alleviating needs around us. Jesus said something about that when he said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. I was in prison. I was sick and you came to me. And they said, we never saw anything like that. He said, if you did done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. But that's, that's mercy. And he says, you're going to do it with cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. In other words, that is the overwhelming atmosphere that you bring into the situation. Not cheerfulness this is ha-ha fun, but your presence in those dark valleys will make a positive difference. That's the gift of mercy, and some people have that. Some people have that. Now, the Apostle Paul said this, having gifts, let's use them. Let's use them. Jesus said it this way. 
In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 14, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who went into a far country. And before he left, he called his servants together, and he gave every one of them talents. He gave to one, one. He gave to another, five. He gave to another, ten. You know the story. Everybody got something to work with. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who went away on a far journey. He called his servants together. Everybody got something to work with. Don't miss that. And the one that was scolded and called wicked was not because he did something bad. It's because he did nothing good with what God had given him. He just wrapped it up and buried it, and it was hidden from view. Is that our gift? Is that our gift? You know, I, I was trying to come up with an example or some sort of illustration to kind of illustrate maybe how God would feel about the situation. This, this is all I could come up with. Say I've got a good friend. His name is Philip. I don't know if there's any Philips here. I'm just dry, grabbing a, a name out of the hat. His name is Philip. And Philip has been known to take some pretty good pictures, some pretty good pictures, and sometimes he does pictures for family events and that sort of thing and weddings and that kind of thing. Well, Philip doesn't have a real good camera, and in fact, the camera he had broke. Well, Philip's birthday comes along, and I'm thinking, I'm going to do something really good for Philip. I'm going to give him the best portrait camera that money can buy. I'm, I'm, this is going to be great. This is, going, this is going to change his life because his camera's broke. So <clears throat> get the camera, do some research. The best camera we can get for, for that application, a, a portrait camera and that sort of thing. So I wrap it all up, I give it to him for his birthday and weeks and all pass. And I run into one of my buddies and he says something about getting married and said, we're trying to find somebody to take pictures for that wedding. I said, man, you ought to call Philip. Philip has a knack for that. He said, I tried to call Philip, but I called him. He said he couldn't do it because he didn't have a camera. Excuse me? Yeah, he said he didn't have a camera. And I ran into Amanda, and she said the same thing. She wanted him to do a family reunion. They were all getting together for a family portrait. And I asked Philip, he said, I can't do that. I don't have a camera. How do you think I'm going to feel? I know Philip has a camera. I gave him the camera. Now I'm hearing that Philip's not using the camera and he's telling people he doesn't have one. Exactly when we as a Christian, as a believer, with a straight face will say, I don't have any spiritual gifts. We do have spiritual gifts, every single one of us. How do you find it where we use it? We start doing something. Let me tell you, find out real quick what my gifts aren't. But then you start finding out what God has gifted you in. And that's, like you said, don't think more highly of yourself as you ought to think. It's a gift. But recognize what God has called you to do. And God gifts us to do that. And there's no way I could stand behind this podium Sunday after Sunday without the gift of God to do that. It is beyond me. It is it's too big. I couldn't do it by myself. Having gifts, let's use them. Because God knows that we have them. God knows what we have. And let me just say this. <clears throat> Sometimes you work with your gift and you work with your gift, you know, as God has given you the ability to do things. And you're real busy in the church and all, and you, just, you, you don't know what you've accomplished. Let me just say this. I'm going to say this by experience. I'll tell you why. Your gift and the effect of your gift will outlive you, will outlive you. I grew up in a, in a real happy home. It was a loving home. Grew up, of course, we started out there in El Dorado <clears throat> and grew up in a happy home. Never heard my mom and dad raise their voice at each other. Now, I'm sure they didn't always see eye to eye, but we never heard any, any arguing, fussing, and fighting at all. It was always a very loving home. Me and Keith and Amy, we got along really well. Sometimes got along too well because we get into a lot of mischief because we work together on some things. But we all got along really well, and we even got to talking about it. And Keith and Amy and I said, you know, we, we never heard my mom and daddy squabble. It, that wasn't that kind of home. We came up in a very, very loving home. And so it was, it was a happy little bubble that we lived in. And we went to the church, Van Treats United Methodist Church, there on the south side of El Dorado. It was long since disbanded, I think it's St. Mark's Church out there in the... Uh, 
in the, the west side of town. And so we went to church there, and we still think about the happy days of our, of our of vacation Bible schools and Sunday school and all that. I mean, it was some great days going up through elementary school, and then we moved to Magnolia. And of course, we moved to Magnolia. We left that behind as far as the Van Trees Church. And then, of course, you get into junior high and high school days, and things start changing. You begin, of course, to, to kind of branch out on your own. You're a little bit more independent. You still, of course, have a loving home, and, but you begin to be your own person to move away, and then you get married and move off, and then, of course, enters into the ministry. Uh, adulthood is hard enough as it is, but then sometimes, you know, I, I do walk through some of the darkest valleys with people and some unimaginable hurt in some very dark times with people and trying to to walk with people through their valleys and all, and sometimes it can it can get. Some days the burden's pretty heavy. And just a few days ago, just a few weeks ago, some of this in, incredible painful times I was helping people with. I remembered something. I remembered something from my days in elementary school. I was probably seven, eight, nine years old. And it was at Van Trees United Methodist Church. They preached the gospel there. I learned about Jesus there. It was a great little church. But on Sunday morning, when we'd get to church and go to Sunday school, we'd be all up in our dress clothes. And Van Trees was one of those old churches, had the, the ground floor and the, the sanctuary was on another floor. You had these steep steps and all, but we always went on the ground floor. That's where the Sunday school rooms were. Sunday school rooms, of course, you went in, there was this hall that branched off into two different directions. Standing there where that hallway branched off to two different directions, Mr. Carmichael. I never knew what his first name was. I just knew him as Mr. Carmichael. I could just, I could just remember his name. And I talked to Keith and Amy about that just later, earlier, about a week ago. I said, hey, do you remember Mr. Carmichael? Both of them said, yeah, we remember Mr. Carmichael. Nobody knows his first name. I don't know what he did. I didn't know what position he had in the church or anything. But when I think of Van Treats, United Methodist Church, I think of Mr. Carmichael. Well, what did Mr. Carmichael do? Well, when we went into that hallway to go to Sunday school, Mr. Carmichael was an elderly man. He was an older man. Little wire rim glasses, got a twinkle in his eye. And Mr. Carmichael would stand in the hall and he would hug every kid that came to church that morning. I remember. I remember just running up to him. Isn't that something, the things you remember? I don't remember much and can't find my coffee cup, but I remember that. That was like 50-something years ago, close to 60 years ago. I remember running up. And Mr. Carmichael, he would wrap his arms, big old arms around you, and he would hug you, and he would be laughing. And, oh, it was just great. Now, that guy had the gift of encouragement and cheerfulness. And I remember that. And you know, that helped me to remember Mr. Carmichael picking us up and loving on us and hugging us. And in some of the darkest times that sometimes you face in ushering people through grief and hardship, that lifted me up. And of course, first thing I thought of is, boy, I sure wish I could run to Mr. Carmichael right now. I think we all need somebody to hug us and hold us close, give us some cheer. See, his gift, I don't know what else he did, but he had a gift of making kids feel loved. And I had plenty of love in the first place, but it was something special, wasn't it? And now 60 years later, I'm still benefiting from that memory of Mr. Carmichael. And that's the beauty of gifts. We use them now, but God can use them after we're gone. And I, we moved away in 1970 in July, never went back, never heard what happened to Mr. Carmichael. And he never knew the kind of impact he made on those Goldwell kids' lives. And the impact he made just here a while back, when out of the blue, I'd forgotten all about him, boom, God brought Mr. Carmichael to my mind and those big old hugs, and my day was a lot better. Having then gifts, let's use them. Now, this is only possible 
because of the greatest gift of all. And I like to picture it as there's one big gift, one big box wrapped up, and that's the gift of eternal life. In the book of Romans, the same book, chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the 6.23 says this, the wages of sin is death. This is what we earn. But he said, oh, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then later on in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 32, he said, if he freely offered his son for us, don't you think he can freely give us all things? Oh, yeah. So we realize he gives us this big box of a relationship with him, eternal life, and we open the box up and we say, hey, this is not the end of it. There's more presence in here. And we're just pulling out gift after gift after gift. That's what it looks like. But all of those gifts are meant to be used to share that greatest gift of eternal life with those around us. Do you know it? Are you saved? Do you know Christ for sure, the sins forgiven? Have you accepted the salvation that's so freely given? If you say, yes, I have, and I want to live for him, can't do it by yourself, but God's given you a gift. Maybe you just need to say a prayer this morning, help me find that gift if I hadn't already, and I do know that gift, help me plug in, find a place to use it. Having then gifts, let's use them. Too much is at stake. There's a world that needs to hear about the message of the greatest gift of all. As we stand and sing.